Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. His name is Bob Elliott. He's the CEO of Unlimited. And something really cool about Bob is he was the head of Ray Dalio's investment committee for close to 11 years, built many of the strategies for the $100 billion Alpha Fund, which at the time was the largest hedge fund in the world, was also the GM of Circle Up's VC arm or venture, if you will, and then co-founded the charity GiveWell and is now the co-founder and CEO, as I started with, of Unlimited, which is an investment firm that uses proprietary tech to create accessible, low-cost index tracking ETFs for alternative investments like hedge funds. I didn't get, I, I left a little part out, but it was getting a little worried, so I had to cut it eventually. Bob, welcome. Happy to have you on the show, man. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Uh, love your history. Love, uh, really interested with what you're doing. So uh, before we get into that, though, I want to go and do a real quick revenue rundown. So what stage of the journey are you guys at in terms of your ARR? Yeah, I mean, we started the business about 15 months ago from scratch um, and launched our first product uh, in October and currently oh, have uh, just just under a million bucks in uh, run rate revenue uh, in in our first product, uh, looking to scale that um, and you know put that into a position to be able to raise a Series A, uh, which has now given us the resources to be able to now build a a full platform of uh, index tracking ETFs for alternative investment strategies. Okay, love that. So, uh, like, walk us through your solution in like two or three sentences, exactly what it does and who it serves. Yeah, I mean, most financial advisors try to bring alternative assets to their clients, and the problem with that they find is that most of their clients are too small to either get in those funds or get into the best ones, and so. What we've done is we've, we're drawing on our decades of experience having actually built strategies in these funds to create ETFs that replicate what they're doing. And because they're in an ETF wrapper, they're available to every investor, 25 billion bucks. And, uh, and they're in a much more efficient wrapper uh, for advisors to use because, you know, they don't have to fill out paperwork. It's much cheaper. Uh, than other two and twenty style strategies, other alternative strategies, and it's just much more efficient for everyone involved to use that ETF wrapper rather than go try and hunt for individual managers that might be successful. Okay, I love that, and because it, it democratizes that those unique alternative investments that you're talking about. That it sounds like probably ninety nine point five percent of people don't have access to. Is that a good way to kind of summarize it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, for, for most investors, I mean, you have to be able to cut checks of a few million bucks in order to get access to strategies that are like the most sophisticated in sort of institutional quality strategies. And what we're doing is we're basically using technology and our experience, having built these strategies to build ETFs that anyone can invest in that replicate those returns uh, in a way that's accessible to everyone. And so the idea is, you know, two and 20 strategies at a much lower fee structure, much more tax efficient and available to every investor. Uh, since, as you say, most investors don't have access to sophisticated alternative investment strategies uh, in their portfolios. Well, and can you explain for the layman what or woman, right? What the two and 20 uh, style is for alternative investments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a whole business, $17 trillion of financial assets that are invested in these in these strategies, hedge funds, venture capital, private equity, you've probably heard of those things out there in the world. Um, two and 20 is sort of a tongue in cheek way to refer to how the fee structure is typically structured. So most of okay. those managers will take a 2% uh, each year Fee two percent of the AUM of the of the assets each year plus twenty percent of the profits, and what that means is that most of those managers are charging, you know, five percent, six percent, seven percent a year on those products. And what we're doing is we're offering similar outcomes for just a ninety-five basis point management fee, not oh, oh, point, under one percent uh, uh, fee structure. And so we think that that offers like a, a, a much better value. Uh, for any investor, and in addition to the fact that it's accessible to every investor, so that's you know that's what we've done with our first ETF, the HFND ETF, and now we're going to launch a suite of products that uh, make a broader set of strategies available. 
Okay. And I love that. And when you say products, you're saying like investment products, not investment products, ETFs that, you know, anyone okay. could buy. You, know, you could go to, you know, Robinhood or uh, talk to your financial advisor today about buying these products. They're, they're buying the HFND ETF. It's available. Uh, it's widely available at this point. Okay. And so this brings me to kind of my next question is like, what's your, your, your distribution go to market or how do you push this out to the masses? Like what's your approach and, and how do you do it? Yeah. I mean, most two and 20 style strategies, it's like, you know, rich folks talking to rich folks in back rooms. And our idea is, you know, not only just to democratize the, the access to the returns, the ETF itself, but also to bring institutional quality insight about what's going on with financial markets and how to manage money and bring that available to every investor. And so a big part of what we've done is developed uh, a real content forward strategy. When I was at Bridgewater, I, I used to write the daily observations, which was a very well-read institutional research piece, basically bringing that sort of institutional quality investment insight and making it freely available to everyone. For those of you who you know are on Twitter, I'm at Bobby Unlimited. Same at the, on on Threads, the new uh, the new platform I'm there as well, where people can really see and understand what our reasoning is, uh, how to navigate these challenging market environments, and that really is the is the lead to help engage advisors and investors where they are. Right, they're looking for investment information on Twitter through podcasts you know, through newsletters and things like that. And that starts to build the credibility with them. And then, you know, for a certain subset of investors, it, the HFND ETF is appropriate for their portfolios. And they come to us and they say, hey, I know you, I know you're credible. I have an under, you know, I appreciate what you're putting out there in the world uh, in terms of investment understanding and, and, and helping navigate this market environment. I'm also interested in HFND. Let's have a conversation about that. And that's how we work through the process. Okay. So you're you're not targeting like um, financial advisor organizations or anything, or you're kind of indirectly doing that through inbound through content creation. Is that yeah? You'd be you'd be surprised that most financial advisors, if you're if you're an independent financial advisor, you don't have access to institutional quality research. You don't have people knocking on your door helping you helping you navigate uh, you know challenging market environments. And so you are on Twitter. Right. Most of those independent advisors are on Twitter. Uh, they're listening to podcasts. They're trying, you know, they're reading blogs and newsletters from people that they trust. And so that's really where we're engaging. We're finding those advisors. But what we're doing is we're meeting them where they are, which is mm -hmm. in those spaces rather than, uh, you know, rather than just hoping that they that they come or by knocking on their door physically and trying to sell them something that they may not be interested in. We're meeting them where they are, providing them that insight, and that's getting them excited about what we're doing in Unlimited. Okay, love them. And then, you know, I guess like why did you you have a a treasure trove of experience? So why did you decide to create this product? Well, I think you know, from my experience, I've been in the two and twenty business for twenty years. I've been part of the problem uh, in terms <laughs> of you know making uh, institutions and wealthy individuals, you know, richer in the process. And it, and it just nagged at me uh, for the last few years about whether there was a way to bring those sorts of sophisticated asset management strategies and bring them to the everyday investor. And when we started working on this and realized that, um, that we could replicate, uh, you know, in a pretty good way, in a, in a pretty good way, the types of returns and strategies that exist uh, mostly for those institutional asset managers, you know, those institutions and make those available to everyone, you know, whether it's buying a $20 share or whether it's buying, you know, millions of dollars, that that's very exciting. That's much more exciting than, you know, starting my own hedge fund or, or, you know, starting my own venture fund or something like that, that it's much more exciting uh, and much more challenging to say, how do we bring these returns to everyone? And uh, the, the thing that's really, you know, um, exciting about that is that if we can break through and make these uh, strategies available to everyone, you know, you can have the everyday investor uh, have their portfolios, their wealth, their returns really benefited from getting access to these strategies that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. Okay, love that. And so what's the variance you're, you're saying versus a normal ETF of, let's just say, like a market, like an S&P one where it's like seven and a half percent? 
if you got whatever versus, and I know you, you're not giving investment advice or, or uh, <laughs> committing to any guarantees or anything like that, but what would, what would you, what would be a target return you would look for with, with this investment or this vehicle? Yeah, I mean, most people, some people have the intuition that hedge funds are like hot shots and have enormously volatile returns. It's not really right. Hedge funds are super prudent managers of, uh, of capital. And so in general, what they're trying to deliver and what we see over the course of the last 20 years is equity-like returns at a substantially lower volatility, about half the monthly volatility and about a third of the drawdowns. Uh, you know, so... So that's kind of the return profile. Instead of investing in the volatility of the equity market, you can allocate some of your capital to these hedge fund strategies, which give similar style returns, frankly, with a lot less stress. I mean, if you look at over the past, like let's say from uh, the beginning of COVID to today, right? Incredibly volatile asset markets, economic environment, et cetera. Uh, hedge fund managers have delivered returns on par with stocks during that period but with one fifth of the volatility. So a lot, really? you know, similar returns with a lot less stress along the way. But the way it is now is they're, they're taking five to 6% off the top, right? Which, which is what you're, you're looking to change. So I think that's- Right, and that's the, basic, that's the basic problem. These, these managers like hedge funds are, the managers are very good at generating good returns. The problem with hedge funds and private equity and venture is they're also char good at charging very high fees. And so if you can if you can bring the fees down, the difference between, you know, a nine, you know, an under one percent fee versus a four or five, six, seven percent fee radically changes the outcome for the investor. Right. Because the investor doesn't care what the return is before the fees. They only care what the return is after the fees and after the taxes. And by putting it into a vehicle, using technology to replicate what these managers are doing, we can offer it a much lower cost structure. And also putting it in the ETF wrapper means that it, it's a much lower tax burden because ETFs mm -hmm. are essentially a tax loophole for most investors. And so we can offer it a much lower tax burden. So you take that net of fees, net of taxes outcome, and it's a very compelling return stream relative to index investing because you're getting similar net of fees, net of taxes outcomes, but with that lower volatility, those those smaller drawdowns in your portfolio. Love that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of like what happened with the whole, I mean, would you say it's similar to, I mean, this is my, my take on it, like when it went from like a straight brokerage model to the whole advisory model where it was just like a fat, uh, a flat fee, not advisory model, but the, um, Fiduciary model, right? Yeah. Uh, would you say it's kind of like the same change, but you're bringing that to the alternative investment kind of well, space? I, I think there's been in, incredible innovations in terms of in terms of lowering cost and increasing access in the investment management space, right? If you think about, you know, 50 years ago, Vanguard started, and we went from a time when you know mutual fund managers and brokers were making you know one, two, three, four percent basically to supply the S and P 500, which is now free basically had the same structure for the last 40 years, no changes, which is essentially making the managers wealthy at, at the expense of the investors. And so this idea of bringing, lowering the cost, we like to say we're bringing the indexing revolution that totally changed stock and bond investing and bringing it to the world of alternative investments. That's really what we're doing. And that, you know, that's the, that's the path this world is on is to lower fee, better returns, more accessibility. And we hope to be one part of that overall process in an area that really has not innovated much relative to most of the rest of the financial system. Yeah, I mean, I mean it makes a lot of sense. Dollars and cents, right? <laughs> <laughs> not to be cheesy or throwing a dad joke there or whatever. I but, love uh, it. I love it. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's kind of <laughs> what it is. So, so you were at Bridgewater for 11 years, correct? And uh, almost were... uh, 13 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 13. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So you're, the, you're almost 13 years and you worked with Ray Dalio. Walk us through what you did and then, you know, what that experience was like working with Ray Dalio. Yeah. I mean, uh, for those who don't know, Ray Dalio founded Bridgewater Associates. He's, you know, uh, uh, arguably one of the most successful uh, hedge fund managers in history. Um, and, and working with him, you know, was, was really great, particularly early in my career because, um, what Bridgewater's uniquely skilled at 
is uh, is developing a fundamental understanding of the macro economy. And that's really when, when you say macro, what that means is understanding what's going to happen with growth, with inflation, with stocks, with bonds, with credit instruments, sort of understanding that global dynamic and then using that understanding uh, to to make bets in markets, to to make money. And I think it was a it was a very good place to start. Um, because it really gave me a foundational understanding of essentially the whole landscape uh, and how markets and economies worked, which really then, you know, I, I'm harnessing that understanding to then look at what are certain asset managers doing and how do they think about constructing their portfolios and what are those sort of universal principles that they're applying. I can leverage that experience that I've had and apply it there. And I think that's a really important um, important set of skills I developed during that time. I think it's also really important to recognize that um, part of the benefit of understanding macro and seeing uh, the world through that lens is that um, there's always something interesting, incremental information. There's always that processing that's going on. And I think for a lot of investors, like you wake up one day, there's a CPI report. You have no idea how to, how do you contextualize it? What does it mean? You know, someone says we're late cycle. What does that mean? for an asset market, for an asset portfolio. And a lot of what I enjoy doing in, in on my Twitter and our blog and things like that is, is taking that insight that frankly I use to generate, you know, differentiated returns while I was at Bridgewater, take that understanding and help other investors, you know, the everyday investors, independent advisors, et cetera, help, under, help them understand what's going on in the world. It's a very challenging world. Macro is increasingly important over the last few years. And so for a lot of those investors, you know, who don't have that background, it can be very confusing. And, you know, I frankly really enjoy bringing that to the table and helping them navigate through these challenging environments. Well, so what, what do you think the macro environment is now and over the next you know, three to five years, what do you see happening based on your, your experience and, and your view of that? Where, where do you think things are heading? Well, I think a lot of us, you know, in our professional careers kind of know one path, which is low in flow, stable inflation, uh, and stocks uh, are, are, you know, generally are going up quite well. And in particular, over the last 15 years of uniquely stimulative monetary policy. And we've also learned that bonds are good diversifiers to stocks in that environment. But all of that is very predicated on a secular decline in inflation and stability. And I think we've we've really been, you know, many investors have been shocked over the course of the last 18 months, finally recognizing that, you know, low and stable inflation is not a given in this world. And certainly there are good macroeconomic reasons to think that the disinflationary dynamics that we've seen over the last 40 years are unlikely to persist in the future. A lot of that, a lot of those dynamics are reversing on a forward looking basis. You know, we had a time of peace versus a time of war. We had a time of global integration. And now we're having a, a, a time where, where globally we're pulling back from each other, right? We're creating near shoring rather than international offshoring. Those sorts of dynamics are the things that created that that low inflation that we got used to that are reversing. And so we're in, entering an environment of much higher inflation and where a lot of the dynamics, the, the, the lessons learned, the rules of thumb that we've had, that we've learned over the course of the last 40 years, those things are no longer going to work in the future. And so things like creating diversified portfolios um, where you're considering what could happen if inflation is elevated for an extended period of time, I think are the key, uh, the key dynamics, the key things that investors need to start thinking about today in order to protect themselves from those environments. Because the the only the 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 you know a growth slowdown, weak growth and weak economic activity, uh, and falling stock prices isn't that bad if you can protect yourself again uh, from that by holding bonds in your portfolio. And that's basically what you've been able to do. The, the terrible outcome, the ruinous outcome for investors is environments where inflation is elevated and asset prices are, returns are poor and the value of your money is deteriorating. And that is, that is a, a, a confluence of challenging conditions for investors and savers that we may be entering that we need to start to be prepared for. What's the answer? Well, the answer is is to diversify your portfolio. Look beyond stocks and bonds. 
look to things like gold and commodities in a portfolio. And then the other thing I'd say, and, and one of the reasons why I'm excited to bring these sorts of strategies to, to the everyday investor is bringing, bringing in low cost uh, asset, you know, uh, active management can be very effective through these dynamics. Like instead of trying to navigate it yourself, hiring folks, essentially hiring the hedge fund community to help you navigate through these challenging market environments uh, can be very beneficial to a portfolio, uh, assuming it's done at the right cost and the right tax structure. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is to kind of bring that to the everyday investor so they can improve the likelihood of success in their portfolios. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. How do you think it, AI is impacting the, the macroeconomic environment? Well, we're, we're very early in this process of understanding how, uh, you know, these next generation technologies are going to influence things. I think as a as a person who's seen, you know, I've only seen 30 years of, of uh, technology improvements from a professional perspective. But, you know, there's always the rush. There's always the hope that various steps will radically change how we operate and radically change how the economy functions. And in reality, what you see is time and time again, there are basic core fundamental principles about how uh, technological innovation influences uh, markets and economies. And, you know, in the same way the shift from the horse to the car had certain effects on companies and productivity, or the move from the agriculture, you know, there was a time when 90% of Americans were agricultural producers to today where it's, you know, only a handful of percent. Those sorts of innovations that happened before. And what you see is um, that if we are going through another one of those cycles, we'll probably have similar outcomes. The reality is um, that those sorts of things make people productive and they make companies more productive. And both individuals, the workers, as well as the companies benefit from it, because as they become more productive, uh, you know, they earn higher wages, they earn more income. And so it isn't just like the, the, you know, the tales where it's like AI is going to fire every employee in America. Um, and, you know, we're all going to be living on the street, except for the AI overlords. Like, that's not how it works. And it's not how it works worked when we went from agriculture to, to industry. It's not how it works when we worked when we went from, you know, horses to cars. Uh, and it's not how this dynamic is going to work. Most likely, it's going to make people more productive. It's going to make them more efficient. They're going to be able to do more. And as a function, they're going to be able to earn higher wages over time. The main thing for any individual investor, or any individual person, is you got to be up on your skills. Like, that's just the reality. You're going to be in a better shape if you're getting ahead of that and, you know, and trying to leverage those technologies rather than being affected by those technologies. And so, you know, that's that's for for all of us. Trust me, I, I, I see it in the investment management business. You know, we've got to be on the cutting edge of those strategies. One of the things we're using at Unlimited are those cutting edge strategies that have been developed recently. Um, use it to your advantage rather than being uh, being uh, competed away by. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think it could turn, like in terms of employees, it could turn a C player into a B player, a B player into an A player, and an A player into an A plus player, right? And I mean, I've seen things that used to take me eight hours to do that I could do in 15 minutes now. So there's a massive opportunity there. Right. And you've gotten of... more productive, but you got plenty of work to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, well yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of factors in there, right? We got the baby boomers coming up, you know, so the, the I don't know. I, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But um, so I guess let's, let's switch gears a little bit. So what was your favorite story that you had? when you worked with Ray Dalio at Bridgewater? Well, I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of my favorite experiences um, when I was at, was at Bridgewater was when I was relatively early in my career. Uh, it was just when the sort of storm clouds were gathering um, uh, around the financial crisis. And um, having worked with, worked with Ray, he basically turned to me one day and said, you know, this financial crisis, is it gonna be big or is it gonna be small, right? And so, you know, I think, <laughs> I went and worked hard and, and you know, very much uh, tried to figure that out. And, and we worked together to, you know, really almost 18 months ahead of when it became a real thing in the, in the public sphere. 
recognized that it was likely to be a, a substantial financial crisis. Um, and through that, I, I'd say two things. One, of course, there's, you know, given that understanding, managing the money successfully through it. And Bridgewater was one of the um, one of the best performing funds through an incredibly challenging market environment. And so that was very exciting to see the, that work really very directly impact the asset management business. But I think a big another big part of the process was recognizing that for those of us who had, you know, I'd say a, a somewhat unique insight into how the financial system was working, um, mm -hmm. we spent a fair amount of time working with companies and frankly, the government, the White House, Treasury, uh, the Fed, to help them navigate through that environment. And it's something that I, you know, still to this day, uh, make sure that I, I, um, I'm very responsive to, which is, you know, government officials, they are trying their best. They work very hard. They're trying to understand incredibly sophisticated, complex environments. And so to the extent that those of us who are in the, um, you know, in the industry, who have that insight, who can help bring those regulators, those government officials along, um, you know, it, it's very important that we, you know, we do our share, right? That happens to be our skill that we can contribute to, you know, to the um, to the American enterprise, so to speak. Um, and it's very rewarding. And I can tell you there are certain aspects of certain legislation, certain ways in which that financial crisis was navigated, you know, in the grand scheme, it was, it was painful, but it was navigated pretty well. We did not have a great depression. There were certain aspects of that were that, that were directly uh, the outcome of conversations and guidance that, you know, I was directly involved in and, you know, was beneficial to many people on Main Street. And that is, you know, that is something that is very, you know, to this day is something that, um, you know, I think about often and, you uh, and I find, you know, is is great that I could contribute my small part through such a challenging environment. No, that's great. I mean, you made it. I mean, I, I can see the pride in in the way you describe it. But that makes, I mean, it makes sense, man. You you did something that mattered, and it was for people that had probably not even a glimmer of the insight that you had, or didn't have the time to create that, and it, it made a big big impact, right? In terms of like. How I mean, granted, things were bad, but things could have been way worse, right? They could have been. <laughs> they could have been way worse. And trust me, having sat essentially inside the rooms, looking at um, how bad it could be, um, if if worse policy decisions were made, if you know imprudent policy decisions were made, it um, you know it could have been it could have been a lot worse. And not you know I think looking back fifteen years later, people talk about well the bailout of of Wall Street, et cetera. Like uh, there's a there's a great 60 minutes interview with Ben Bernanke, you know, who is from who's from the South and and from Main Street. He's from Main Street, America, sitting on uh, sitting on Main Street at the town he grew up in, and saying, "Hey, look, what matters is uh, that we protect the people on Main Street um, from the challenges in this macro uh, macro economy and macro environment." And I. You know, I think that that's a, that's a very good when you think about sort of the values and the principles that you want to bring to, you know, leveraging your skills. I think there's some people who are like, let me make as much money as I possibly can and milk the system. And I think it was a good moment and lesson about how do you bring your insight and skills and help make people's lives better, not worse through that understanding. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bob, this is a pleasure having you on the show. We are up on time. Where can people find you? Where can they find more about getting in the unlimited fund? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about uh, our uh, ETF, the HFND ETF, you can, of course, talk to your advisor, uh, or you can check out our website, unlimitedetfs.com. Um, and if you're interested in in my sort of regular macro commentary, definitely check me out on Twitter. Very active. Love to to talk to people on there. Uh, my handle's at Bobby Unlimited. Um, you can look me up, and I'm also, as I said, on uh, on the new app threads uh, under the same handle. Excellent, man. Well, I'll I'll, I'll check it out. I can go for a little macroeconomic uh, <laughs> news in my feed. You know, I can tell you know what you're talking about. Uh, but no, you did an amazing job. Thanks for being on the show, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. All right, and thank you for joining us. We will see you on the next episode.